reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Professor Hayek, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you here today. We had a chat uh, last night, but I appreciate the opportunity to have a chance to talk to you again. Um, they told me I was supposed to talk to you pretty largely on, or at least to start, on the subject of political theory. And um, I'd like to start off with what is a very general topic, if we might. Uh, in his book published in April in England, Lord Hailsham argued that uh, one of the problems that we face in, in Western nations these days is that we have been suffering under this delusion that somehow, so long as governments were in fact responsible electorally to the people that we didn't, didn't need to worry about putting limits on government. Now at a much more profound level, you argue that point also in the third volume of Law, Legislation, and Liberty. I think it would be useful to start off this discussion if you would just uh, talk about that a little. Why did we get involved in this sort of delusion, and I think it is delusion, uh, to the effect that somehow we didn't need to worry about limiting government if, in fact, we could make the politicians responsible. Well, I've been very much puzzled by this, but I think I've discovered the origin of this. It begins with the utilitarians, with Bentham and particularly James Mill, who had this conception that once it was a majority who controlled government, no other restriction on government was any longer possible. It comes out quite clearly in... Uh, James Mill, and uh, later in John Stuart Mill, who once says, the people, what is his phrase? The will of the people needs no control if it's the people who decides. Now that, of course, is a complete confusion. I mean, the whole history of constitutionalism till then was a restraint on government, not by confining it to particular issues, but by limiting the form in which government could interfere. The conception, which was still very large then, that coercion could be used only in the enforcement of general rules which applied equally to all. And the government had no powers to discriminatory assistance or prevention of particular people. Now, the dreadful thing about the forgetting of this is that, of course, it's no longer the will of the majority or the opinion of the majority, I prefer to say, which uh, determines what the government does, but the government is forced to satisfy all kinds of special interests in order to build up a majority. It's in the process. There's not a majority which agrees but the problem of building up a majority by satisfying particular groups. So I feel that a modern kind of democracy, what I call unlimited democracy, is probably more subject to the influence of special interests than any form or form of government was. Even a dictator can say no. But this kind of government cannot say no to any splinter group which it needs to be a majority. Um. Is it not true that perhaps this attitude or this delusion uh, was more widespread in Britain than in the United States? It does seem to me that sort of the notion of constitutional limits, separation of powers, was more pervasive in, in the United States with our founding fathers and, and later in the Well, among the founding fathers, there were some who very clearly saw the very point yeah, I'm making. Yeah. And I believe the ditto by the design of the American Constitution to achieve a limit on the powers. After all, the one phrase in the American Constitution, rather than the First Amendment, which I think most highly of, is the phrase, Congress shall make no law. 
Oh, that's unique. And the first unfortunate is only a particular point. I think a uh, phrase ought to read, Congress should make no law authorizing government to take any discriminatory measures of coercion. I think this would make all the other rights unnecessary and creates the sort of uh, conditions which I want to see. I think that's interesting that you refer to that because now we seem to have got ourselves in a position where the more laws Congress makes, that's the way we measure its uh, yeah. productivity. <laughs> but to let me go on a little bit to raise the, the, the question that, that, uh, that this uh, implies, and that is, um, I certainly have worked in this area, and you have too, somehow on the faith that, that uh, we can impose some constitutional limits on government. Uh, but are we not really, uh, isn't that sort of a blind faith? Uh, don't we have to maybe come back to the Hobbesian view that uh, either we have anarchy, and I think you and I would agree that anarchy wouldn't work, or else we have Leviathan, and how, how do we base, or how do you base yours, is what I'm specifically asking, how do you base your faith that we can impose constitutional limits? Oh, on the fact in which I profoundly believe in the long run, things are being governed by opinion. And opinion just has been mislaid, and it was the whole group of opinion makers, both the thinkers and the what's now called the media, the second hand dealers in uh, ideas, who had become convinced that dependence on a majority view was a sufficient limitation of the governmental powers. I think it's now almost universally recognized that it is not. I think if one raises the matter again, a situation like the one which, ex an intellectual situation like the one which existed in the United States at the time the Constitution was written, could again be created. Oh. But, but can we have the opportunity to do that? That's the thing. Yes. I believe there is a chance of uh, making the intellect was proud of seeing through the delusions of the past. That is my present ambition, you know, to is largely concerned with socialism, but of course socialism, unlimited democracy, come very much to the same thing. And I believe you can put, or at least I have the illusion, that you can put the things in a way in which the intellectuals be ashamed to believe in what their fathers believed. Well, you made that point. I thought it was a very interesting point. Um, that um, now the young people are rediscovering uh, the principles of freedom. Yeah. And I, I think that is a very, very interesting point. Um, but, but I still, I think that, uh, I mean, we can hope that, but I'm perhaps not as optimistic as you are, that, that ideas will ultimately matter. It's partly, um, uh, partly the, just the general point that I don't quite see how they can be transmitted and have much effect. And then there's partly this question about how can we get ourselves in a situation where it would be equivalent to the uh, situation of the Founding Fathers? Will, well, it, will it come through answer, an ordinary... But, uh, yeah. well, I could answer it only indirectly. I think we have to be concerned in our argument not on current influence, but in creating the opinions which will make politically possible what now is not politically possible. It takes something like a generation before ideas conceived by philosophers or abstract thinkers take effect. And Montesquieu and Adam Smith began to operate in public opinion after a generation or even more. And that's why I always say, I think if the politicians do not destroy the world in the next 20 years, which is very likely, uh, I think there's a hope for afterwards. But we have to work for this distant date, which I shan't see, see to happen. <laughs>
Perhaps 20 years is too short. But one thing which gives me confidence is having watched the United States for 50 years, and you seem to change your opinions fundamentally every 10. Well, I think there are some, some encouraging signs, but I think I see well, them... You don't always change yeah. in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> but I see them slightly differently from you, and let me just try out uh, my own view of things a little bit here. Um, it seems to me that we in the United States have really never had much uh, understanding of sort of the principles of markets. Uh, some of the work by Jonathan Hughes and others have convinced me that the sort of interventionist, collectivist, socialist thrust has always been present. And that really the only reason we had uh, burgeoning markets and, and uh, rapid growth and so forth was largely because the government was decentralized, federalized, and so forth, and with migration, frontier, and all, all of that. Uh, and um, I have a good deal of skepticism about the sort of, sort of principles of freedom being uh, adopted by enough people to, to do much. On the other hand, where I see the encouragement or the encouraging signs are that we have lost faith in the collectivist alternative. Yeah. And it does seem to me that in the last 20 years in particular, there's, there's pra there, people don't have faith in the alternative. And the market, as you and I know, will always emerge if you leave it alone. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's an encouraging yeah, aspect. Yeah. Oh, I think people are quite likely to agree on general rules which restrict government without quite knowing what it implies in practice. Mm -hmm. And then I think if that is made a constitutional rule, they will probably observe it. Oh. You can never unless expect the majority of the people to regain their belief in the market as such. But I think you can expect that they come to dislike government interference. If you can uh, make it clear that there's a difference between government holding the ring and enforcing certain rules and government taking specific measures for the benefit of particular people. That's what people at large do not understand. If you start, talk to an ordinary person, say, well, somebody must lay down, down the law, as if that involved all the other things. Yeah. I think that distinction must be made clear. There's not everything Congress resolves is a law. But, uh, in fact, as you know, I'm... I'm uh, joking about the fact that we now do not call the legislature legislature because it gives laws, but because we call everybody a law which is resolved yeah. by the yeah. legislature. So the name law derives from legislature, not the other way around. Well, this, this relates to a question, though, and again, it, it creates a problem of whether or not we can get things changed. It's something that people don't talk about now, but a century ago, John Stuart Mill was talking about it, um, namely the franchise. Uh -huh. Now, it seems to me that we've got ourselves, and again, it goes back to the delusion of democracy in a way, but uh, we've got ourselves into a situation where people who are direct recipients of government largesse, government transfers, are given the franchise. People who work directly for government are giving the fr given the franchise, and we wouldn't question them not having it. Mm. And yet, to me, that's, there's no more overt conflict of interest than the, fran than the, the franchise to those groups. Do you agree with me, or I don't believe you discuss that in your book? No, I don't think the general question of the franchise is what powers they can confer to the people they elect. As long as you elect a single omnipotent legislature, of course, there's no way of preventing the people from abusing the power, or rather the legislature's being forced to make so many concessions to particular groups. I see no other solutions than my scheme of dividing proper legislation from a governmental assembly which is under the laws laid down by the first. And uh, after all such newfangled conception gradually spread and begin to be understood. I mean, after all, in a sense, uh, the conception of democracy was an artifact mm -hmm. which captured public opinion after it had been a speculation of the philosophers. Why shouldn't be the need of uh, 
that under a proper heading, I would put as a need for restoring the rule of law, become an equally effective catchword. One people become, once people become aware of the essential arbitrariness of the present government. Well, how would you see this coming about, though? Uh, would you see uh, somehow getting in a position where we, we call a new constitutional convention and then set up this second body with separate powers, or how would you see this happening? I think by several experiments in new amendments in the right direction, which gradually prove to be beneficial but not enough, till people feel constrained to reconstruct the whole thing. In, in this connection, uh, you have long been, I remember this conference at Wabash we were talking mm. about, you were at that time giving some lectures that later became the Constitution of Liberty, I mm. think. And uh, you were talking about uh, proportional and progressive taxation. And at that time, at least, you were arguing that you felt that proportional taxation would, in fact, come under this general rule rubric, mm -hmm. whereas professional taxation um, would not. Are you, do you still feel that way? And, and oh, would yes. you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, well, the only thing which I don't know well, I saw it clearly then, it applies to the general rate of taxation, not particularly the income tax. Mm -hmm. I do admit that it may be necessary to have a slightly progressive income tax to compensate for the regressive effect of other taxation. But for the tax principle, which uh, ought to be uh, recognized, that the tax laws as a whole should aim at proportional taxation, I still believe in. Uh, what I, in a way, think is more important is under my scheme of the separation of legislation and government. The government should determine the volume of revenue, but the legislative, the form of raising it. Well, the people who decided on expenditure could not decide who should pay for it, but would have to know, would know that they and their constituents would have to pay equally to every contribution they made. Much of the increase of government expenditure is now happening under the illusion somebody else will pay for it. So if you can create a situation which every citizen is aware for every extra expenditure I shall have to pay, make my proportional contribution, I think they might become much more reluctant. I think that's very true. I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, that quotation, we've taken that direct quotation at a, a, a uh, in the thing that we're doing now and trying to check out just precisely how what these effects of these alternative constitutional limit schemes are. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may come a little bit into current policy, uh, as you know, in, in this country now, there are all sorts of schemes being uh, put forward uh, as to how we might limit the tax revenues of government. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them try to limit the government in terms of proportion of national product or state product or income. Some of them try to put limits on rates and specific taxes. Do um, you have any preference to any of the, either of those types? Well, I'm puzzled by it because all the discussion seems to turn on taxation, not on expenditure. People even seem to assume that you can go on increasing expenditure without the, at the same time reduce yeah. taxation. I mean, I know, as I say, I know very little about it, but the offhand impression you get is that these people are frightfully confused and assume that you can cut taxation and carry on with the government as it is. Well, perhaps we should talk a little more about this general distinction between law and legislation, which mm -hmm. is certainly central to your political so, theory. Yes. Um, I think uh, uh, I have a pretty good conception of what, uh, what you have in mind here, but perhaps you'd like to elaborate on that a bit. There used to be a traditional conception of law, in which law was a general rule of individual conduct, equally applicable to all citizens, determined to apply to an unknown fu number of future instances, and that law in this sense should be the only justification of coercion by government. Government should have no, under no circumstances, except perhaps in an emergency, 
have any power of discriminatory coercion. That was a conception of law which in the last century by the jurists had been very fully elaborated. In the continental, European continental literature, it was largely discussed under the headings law in the material sense, which is law in my sense, and law in the merely formal sense, something which has derives the name of law from having decided in the proper constitutional manner, not having the logical character of laws. Now the story why this uh, very sensible effort founded in the end is quite a comic one. At one stage somebody pointed out that would mean that the constitution is not a law. Of course the constitution is a rule of organization, not a rule of conduct. In this sense the constitution would not be a law. But that shocked people so much that they dropped the whole idea yeah. <laughs> and abandoned the distinction altogether. Now I think we ought to recognize that with all the reverence a constitution deserves, after all constitutions are something very changeable, something which has a negative value but doesn't really concern the people very much. You might find a new name for it, for constitutional rules, but we must distinguish between the law under which government acts and the laws of organization of government. That's what the constitution essentially is. A law of condensation of uh, organization of government may pro might prohibit government from doing certain things, but it can hardly lay down the what used to be the rules of just conduct, which was, was what was considered mm -hmm. as law. Well, I'd like to explore this further with you, but I'm sure I better leave that for Professor Bork when he when he talks to you. But let me um, uh, raise another point here in um, in the, I believe it's the preface to the second volume of your Law, Legislation, and Liberty, uh, you say, the Mirage of Social Justice, you say that, uh, in just one sentence, you say that uh, you think that you're attempting to do the same thing, essentially, that John Rawls has tried to do in his theory of justice. Uh, people have queried me about that statement in your book. Well, I perhaps go a little too far in this. I was trying to remind Rawls himself of something he has said in one of his early articles, which I'm afraid doesn't re recur in his book. That the conception of correcting the distribution according to the principle of social justice was unachievable, and that therefore he wanted to confine himself to inventing general rules which had that effect. Now, if he was not prepared to defend social or distributive justice, I thought I could pretend to agree with him. But uh, studying his book further, my feeling is it doesn't really stick to the <laughs> thing he had announced first, and that there is so much egalitarianism really underlying his argument that he is driven to much more intervention than he, his original conception really justifies. I think there's much in what you say. I think there's a lot of ambiguity, and the yeah. first articles were much, were more, were much more clear. But now, in, in your notion, this mirage of social justice, um, is your idea that um, when we try to achieve quote, social justice, unquote, we're likely to do more harm than good, or is it somehow that, that the objective itself is not worth uh, proposing or thinking about? Uh, it's undefinable. People don't know what they mean when they talk about social justice. They have particular situations in mind and hope that uh, if they demand social justice, somebody would care for all people who are in need or something of that kind. But the phrase social justice has no meaning because no two people uh, can agree on what it really means. And I believe, as I say in the preface, I'd written quite a different uh, chapter on the subject, trying that it's impractical in one particular case after another, till I discovered that the phrase had no content, that people didn't really know what they meant by it. And the appeal to the word justice was just because it was a very effective and appealing mm -hmm. word, 
But uh, justice is essentially an attribute of individual human action, and a state of affairs as such cannot be just and unjust. So it's, in the last resort, a logical model. It's not that I'm against it, that I say it has no meaning. Well, you, you remember our old friend Frank Knight used to say that uh, one of the, s the sports for the market is that people couldn't agree on anything else in terms of distribution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think there's, there's probably much, much in that. Well, if they had to agree, it would be good. But with our present method of the democracy, you don't have to agree, but you have to, you are pressed on the pretext of social justice to hand out privileges right and left. Well, do you think this thrust is waning a bit in, in modern politics? Well, I don't know how it's in different countries. I am most concerned, because it's the most dangerous thing at the moment, with the power of the trade unions in Great Britain. And while people are very much aware that things can't go on as they are, nobody is still convinced that this power of the trade unions to enforce wages which they are regarded as just is not a justified thing. I mean, uh, I believe it's a great conflict within the Conservative Party at the moment that one half of the Conservative Party still believes you can operate with the present law and come to an understanding with the trade union leaders while the others do see that unless these privileges of the trade unions to use coercion and force for the achievement of their end is in some form revoked or eliminated, there's no hope of curing the system. We have created an automatic mechanism, which or British, which drives them into more and more use of power for directing the economy which unless you eliminate the source of that power, which is the monopoly power of the trade unions, you can't do. Well, it, is Britain unique in that, say, compared to the United States? Well, uh, things seem to have changed a great deal since I knew the United States better. I mean, 15 years ago, when I knew more about it, it seemed to me that uh, the American trade unions were a capitalist racket rather than uh, in principle opposed to the market as such. Uh, there seem to be tendencies in public opinion and in American legislation to go the British way, but how far it has gone I don't know. The reason why I was so very much uh, acutely aware of the British significance because I happened to, same th happened to see the same thing in my native country Austria which is also a country governed by the trade unions, which is the present moment. Nobody doubts that the president of the trade union association is the most powerful man in the country. The thing works because he happens to be personally an extremely reasonable man. But what will happen if they get a radical in that position? I shudder to think. In that sense, the position in Austria and in England is very similar to that in Britain. Well, uh, the thing is worsening in Germany when I have always maintained that the great prosperity of the Germany in the first 25 years after the war was due to the reasonableness of the trade unions. Their power was greater than they used, very largely because all the trade union leaders in Germany had known what a major inflation was, and you just had to raise your finger. If you ask more, you will have inflation, they would give in. That generation is going off now. The new generation, which hasn't had that experience, is coming up. So I fear the German position may increasingly approach something like, not quite as bad as the British position, because uh, the closed shop is prohibited by law in Germany. And I don't think that will be changed. So there are certain limits to the extension of trade union powers. I can't speak about France. I must say I've never understood internal French politics. And the Italian position is so confused to me. I'm getting more and more the impression that Italian Italy has now two economies. One official one, which is enforced by law, which people spend their mornings doing nothing. And an official one in the evening, when they work on a second job uh, illegally, 
And the real economy is a black economy. Well, you speak of inflation. I don't want to get into the economic aspects, uh, which I, I'm sure you will get into in some other uh, interviews. But uh, let, let me uh, follow up a little bit on the, on the political problems of getting out of inflation. It does seem to me that, that we face the major political problem of a short term, not only in this country, but also in Britain and other countries, of how can we politically uh, get the government to uh, do something about the inflation? Only by a very circuitous way. Uh, first, removing all limitations on people using money other than the government's money, eliminating all the wider sense foreign exchange restrictions, including legal tender laws and so on. So it gives the people a chance of using other money than they would. I mean, my example is also what would happen in Britain if there were no exchange restrictions. The people discovered the Swiss francs are a better money than uh, sterling and began using yeah. Swiss francs. The thing is happening in international trade, you know. The speed with which sterling has been replaced and the dollar is now being right. replaced in international trade as soon as people have the chance to use another money should be replaced into uh, apply internally. The thing ultimately that will be necessary because that's a field where I'm most pessimistic. I don't think there's the slightest hope of ever again making governments pursue a sensible monetary policy. That is the thing which you cannot do under political pressure because it is undeniable that in the short run you can use inflation to increase employment. People will never really understand that in the long run you make things worse that way. And uh, this thing is driving us into a controlled economy because people will not stop inflation inflating but try to combat inflation by price controls. I'm afraid that's the way in which the United States is likely in the near future to slide into a controlled economy. Again, my hope is that uh, you are so quick to change, you might find it so disgusting that uh, you may erect an extremely complex system of price controls and after two years you're so fed up with it that you throw the whole thing over again. I'd like to shift back, if I could, to... Um I'm sure we could spend a lot of time following up on that, but let me shift back, if I could, to, to your basic political theory, political philosophy position. I'd like to ask you a little bit of intellectual history here in terms of your own position. Uh, both of us started out more or less as technical economists, yes. and then we got interested in these more political philosophical questions. Uh, could you trace for us a little bit uh, your evolution of your own thinking in, in, in that respect? Well, I was a little thinking. It began... Well, it really began with my doing that volume on collectivist economic planning, mm -hmm. which uh, was originally merely caused by the fact that I found that certain new insights, which were known on the continent, had not reached the English-speaking world yet. It was largely Mises and his school, but also certain discussions by Barone and others, which were then completely unknown to the English-speaking world, and being forced to explain this development on the continent in an introduction and a conclusion mm -hmm. to that volume, which contained translations, I was curiously enough driven not only into political philosophy, but into an analysis of the methodological mis misconceptions of economics, which seem to me to lead to these naive conceptions of, uh, after all, what the market does, mm. we can do better intellectually. Mm. And my way from there was very largely around methodological considerations, which led me back to, I think, the decisive event was that essay I did about 37 on, uh, what was it called, Economics and Knowledge. That was a brilliant essay. Uh, I think that was a decisive point of the change in my outlook. As I would put it now, 
the conception that the prices serve as guides to action and must be explained in determining what people ought to do, they're not determined by what people have done in the past, which of course was the ecological consequence mm. of the whole modern market mm. utility mm. analysis, uh, was perhaps the decisive point which, uh, as I now see the whole thing, the uh, market as a system of the utilization of knowledge, uh, which nobody can possess yeah. as a whole, which only through the market situation leads people to aim at the needs of people whom they do not know, make use of facilities of which they have no direct information, all this condensed in abstract signals, and that our whole, situa our whole modern wealth and production could arise only thanks to this mechanism, is, I believe, the basis not only of my economic, but as much of my political views. Mm -hmm. It reduces the possible task of authority very much if you realize that uh, the market has, in that sense, a superiority because the amount of information the authorities can use is always very limited, and the market uses an infinitely great amount of information the authorities can ever do. Well, this is very interesting. Well, what you're telling me, as I, as, I, as I get what you're telling me, is that really that it came from an idea uh, uh, rather than sort of an observation of events. Oh, very much so, yes. Uh, many people, I suspect, uh, uh, consider your road to serfdom, which came out, what, 44 or so, yes. uh, as sort of an observation of things that might, might have be happening and then... Uh, no, you see, the road to serfdom was really an advanced sketch of a more ambitious book I had been planning before, which I meant to call the abuse and decline of reason. Uh, the abuse being the idea that you can do better if you determine everything by knowledge concentrated in single power and the consequent effects of uh, trying to replace a spontaneous order by a centrally directed order. And the decline of reason was a phenomenon which we observed in totalitarian countries. That I had in my mind and that in fact became the program of work for the next 40 years. And then a very special situation arose in England, already in 39, uh, that people were seriously believing that uh, national socialism was a capitalist reaction against socialism. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to believe it now, but the uh, main exponent whom I came across was Lord Beveridge, Sir William Beveridge, as he was then, was absolutely convinced that these national socialists are capitalists who react against socialism. So I first wrote a memorandum for Beveridge on that subject, then turned it into a journal article, and then used the war to write out what was really a sort of advanced, popular version of what I had imagined would be the great book on abuse and decline of reason, the second mm. part, the part on the decline of reason. Mm adjusted to the moment and wholly aimed at the British socialist intelligentsia, who all seemed to have this idea that national socialism was not socialism, something contemptible, and just trying to tell them, well, you are going the same way as they do. That the book was so completely differently received in America and that attracted attention in America at all was a completely unexpected event. It was written so definitely in an English, and it was of course received in a completely mm -hmm. different manner. The English socialists, with few exceptions, accepted the book as something written in good faith, raising problems they were willing to consider. People like Lady Wooden wrote a very, in fact with her, I have a very curious experience, said, you know, I wanted to turn out, to point out some of these problems you have pointed out, but now you have so exaggerated that I must turn against you. <laughs> in America it was wholly different. Socialism was a new infection. The great enthusiasm about the New Deal was st still at its height. And here there were two groups, 
people who were enthusiastic about the book but never read it, they just heard there was a book which supported capitalism, and the American intelligentsia, who had just been bitten by the collectivist bug, who felt that this was a betray betrayal of the highest ideals which an intellectual ought to defend, and so was exposed to incredible abuse, I mean, something I never experienced in Britain at the time. And uh, it went so far as completely, almost completely discrediting me, discrediting me professionally. Uh, but in the middle 40s, I sound very conceited, but I think I was known as one of the two main disputing economists. There was Keynes and there was I. Now Keynes died and became a saint, and I discredited myself by publishing the road to serfdom. <laughs> it completely changed the situation. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard you say that you have been where you were so surprised by the reaction to the road to serfdom. On the other hand, I've heard uh, uh, you, I don't believe you, I've heard you say it, but I've heard people say that you were greatly disappointed by the re reaction to the Constitution of Liberty, that you expected much more reaction than yes, you got. Is yes, that, that right? Is, that is true. Do you attribute that to the fact that it was, uh, was more comprehensive? Maybe it was, uh, you tried to include too much or what? Uh, uh. It was a book on political science by somebody who was not recognized as a political scientist. It was on that ground very large, largely collected, uh, neglected by the professionals. It was too philosophical for the philosophers. And see, when I say I was disappointed, I was disappointed as regard the range of effect. It was ex received exceedingly friendly by the people whom I really respect, but there's a very small crowd. I've received higher praise, which I personally value, for the Constitution of Liberty, but from a very small select circle. It had never had any real popular appeal, and perhaps it was a, too big a book for it. Too wide-ranging. People picked out a chapter here and there which they liked. They would reprint my chapter on trade unions because that fitted in their idea. But very few people have fully digested and studied the book. Well, it seemed to me that you were attacking two quite different things in the Constitution of Liberty and in your three-volume Law, Legislation, and Liberty. In the, in the Constitution of Liberty, you were going through and talking about particular areas of economic policy. Uh, trade unions, taxation, uh, this type of thing, uh, coming out with quite specific proposals for reform. Whereas in the um, law, legislation, and liberty, you're really talking more about the structural changes in government that would be necessary before we could even hope to put in such reforms. Mm -hmm. My own thinking would be that these, in a sense, these would be, might have, are, are reversed well, I don't think you represent it quite correctly. See, in the Constitution of Liberty, I deal with these problems only in the third part, which is the third, right. third of right. the book, just to illustrate the general principles I've elaborated in part one or two. But the other point is that in the Constitution of Liberty, I was still mainly attempting to restate for our time what I regarded as traditional principles. I wanted to explain what 19th century liberalism had really intended to do. It was only at the time when I practically finished the book that I discovered that uh, 19th century liberalism had no answers to certain questions. So I started writing the second book on the ground that I was now tackling problems which had not been tackled before. It was not re merely restating, as I thought in an improved form, what was traditional doctrine, but it was tackling new problems, including the problem of democracy. Yes, I do recall that, and I, I remember that it was only the last part of that book mm -hmm. where you took mm -hmm. those particular uh, reforms up, but it seems that in the discussion of that book, that is what has got most of oh, the yeah, attention. Yes, that's perfectly true. But that yeah. illustrates perhaps what I said before. The book was too philosophical on the whole, and people concentrated on the parts where I became more concrete. Yeah. Uh, let me just ask you a little bit now that, that it, um, about your, your view on um, what I would call social cultural evolution. Uh, 
it comes out in several of your pieces in these two volumes of essays, and also in the third volume of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, where you pay, place a great deal of attention on the sort of spontaneous emergence of rules, customs, uh -huh. institutions. Uh, and yet, at the same time, you seem to uh, be willing to classify some things that have emerged as some undesirable. Uh, how do you sort of reconcile these two positions? Well, there's no great difficulty. The things which have been tested in evolution by being selected as superior, selected as even wrong, by prevailing, because the uh, groups which practiced them were more successful than others, by their very origin, had proved a beneficial character. What I object to is the attempt to alter that development by deliberate construction from the outside, which is not necessarily wrong, but where the self-correcting mechanism is eliminated. And while if uh, practices go wrong, the group concern declines, if a government goes wrong and enforces mm -hmm. the mistake it has made, there's no automatic correction of any kind. In this connection, um, do you consider your own views to be close to, or how do they differ from, that of Michael Oakeshott? I confess I sti still have, I mean, there are two new books which I admit in my third volume, I ought to have carefully studied before writing it, but if I had done so, I would never have finished my own book. This is Nozick and Oakeshott. I sympathize with both of them, but I know only parts of them. Now, Oakeshott, I know at least personally fairly well, so I have a fairly good mm. conception of his thinking without having studied his book. I think, put it very crudely, I am a 19th century liberal and he is a conservative. I think that is... Well, one of your, um, <laughs> one of your former students, uh, Shirley Letwin, yes. um, I've talked to her about these pr this problem yeah. a great deal. And she always, uh, when she talks about your work in this connection, she always also ties it in with Oakeshott. Yeah. And so I had assumed there was uh, obviously a closer connection between the two from personal relationships than, than maybe there, ha there is. We can talk with each other, yeah. complete understanding, but to my feeling, I may do him injustice. There are in Oakeshott systems certain hardly conscious general prejudices in favor of a conservative attitude where it is just his feeling which makes him prefer something without his being strictly able to justify his argument but he will justify his not justifying it or uh, he believes that we ultimately must trust our instincts without explaining how we can distinguish between good and bad ones. My present attempt is to say, yes, we rely on traditional instincts, but some of them mislead us and some not, and our great problem is how to select and how to right. restrain the bad ones. Well, now that I'm mentioning people from, from London, let me also ask you about Sir Karl Popper, whom I saw a month ago, incidentally. Um, Shirley Letwin also suggested to me that um, you might have been influenced a good deal by some of Popper's work, apparently stuff that has not really been published, but what she calls his evolutionary ethics, or his attempts to develop an evolutionary ethics. Uh, no, I was prior, and uh, I remember a time when Popper reproached me for my revolutionary, uh, evolutionary approach. That's interesting. You know, the relation is on the whole curious. You see, Popper, in writing already the open society, knew intimately my counter revolution of science articles. And it was in these that he discovered the similarity of his views with mine. I discovered it when the open society came out. <laughs> 
although I had been greatly impressed, perhaps I go back to s as far as that, by his logic of scientific research, his original book. That um, formalized a conclusion to which I had already arrived. I had arrived at due to exactly the same circumstances. Popper is a few years my junior, so I did not know him in Vienna. We were not in the same generation. But we were exposed to the same atmosphere. And in the discussion then, we both encountered two main groups on the other side, Marxists and psychoanalysts. And both had their habit to insisting that their theories were in their nature irrefutable. And I was already by this driven to the conclusion, if a theory is irrefutable, it's not scientific. Yes. Now, I'd never elaborated this. I didn't have the philosophical training to elaborate it. But Popper's book gives the justification yes. for this argument. Yes. That a theory which is necessarily true says nothing about the world. So when his book came out, I could once embrace what he said as an articulation of things I had already been feeling yes. and thinking. And ever since, I followed his work very closely. In fact, he once, before he went to New Zealand, I met him in London. He spoke even to my seminar, and we found very far-reaching basic agreement. And I don't think there's anything fundamental with which I disagree, although I sometimes had at first hesitation. His present new interest about the three worlds, at first I was very puzzled about. I believe and I understand and I agree. Uh, when in that uh, Hophaus lecture, I speak about uh, culture as an external element which determines our thinking, rather our thinking <laughs> determining culture, is, I believe, the same thing which Popper means when he speaks about the third world. And, uh, of course, in the few years we were together at the London School of Economics, it was only from 45 to 50, we became very close friends and see completely eye to eye on practically all issues. He has written a new book with Sir John Eccles on the self I've read brain, his please. part of it. I haven't read Eccles' part, yeah. which essentially develops the point I was just speaking mm -hmm. about, about the third world and... Yes, he, I remember the third world lecture he gave in, um, uh, where was it, at, uh, you know, in Switzerland, at the Montpellier meeting in, in, oh, yeah, yes. at, uh, in, in Switzerland. At that time I didn't understand it. Yes. It was only since uh, things he has written since, which made clear to me, and certain development of my own thinking, which goes in the same direction.